the algorithms did not work. The results were thousands of content providers suddenly having their livelihoods jeopardized with the flick of a switch by YouTube without explanation, notice, or recourse. YouTube content providers and online bloggers have dubbed this date Adpocalypse. Hello everyone, I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney, and I'm here today with the Adpocalypse lawsuit that has been filed by Zombie Go Boom against YouTube over the whole Adpocalypse thing that happened round about March or April of 2017. You may remember that a few major media publications wrote articles about ads being run on controversial material on YouTube, and then a bunch of advertisers pulled out of advertising on YouTube. Very Various uh, content creators, including yours truly, saw their ad rates drop, sometimes more than half, sometimes more than two-thirds, and that was enough to put some channels out of business, at least in the short term, until they figured out uh, how to uh, make up for the gap in earnings. Anyway, apparently, at least one organization, and possibly many more, uh, have filed a lawsuit attempting to hold YouTube uh, accountable for their participation in the adpocalypse. So, this should be pretty good. Let's jump in and take a look at what's in this lawsuit. This is a lawsuit filed in the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of California. It calls itself a class action complaint, but only names James Sweet, Chuck Meir, and Zombie Go Boom as the plaintiffs, and names Google and YouTube as the defendants, and demands a jury trial. Overview. This class action case surrounds widespread anti-competitive and unfair conduct of a monopolistic enterprise which, through intentional, reckless, and or negligent means, has economically stifled the pursuits of enterprising and creative content providers, causing significant loss of revenue and profit. Content providers such as plaintiffs, who use the YouTube forum to post their creative works, are wholly reliant from a revenue stream standpoint on the ability to monetize their content through the advertisements that YouTube permits third-party advertisers to post through the YouTube.com website. A portion of the revenue generated by YouTube is passed through to content providers when an advertisement is viewed and or clicked by a content consumer. The terms governing the payment of revenues through YouTube's advertising monetization plan have been established and ongoing for years, and while not fully transparent, are largely predictable by business and content providers who create content and place it on YouTube. Without an advertisement being posted on a content provider's video or channel in the first instance, no revenue can be generated by the content provider through YouTube's content provider advertising program. YouTube acts as a unilateral gatekeeper in deciding which videos will be monetized. Until recently, this has never presented a problem, and has been applied by YouTube with an even hand. Plaintiffs have monetized their creative entertainment content, which includes hundreds if not thousands of videos that they created and filmed at their expense through YouTube since 2011. Zombie Go Boom has become one of the top YouTube channels since that time, with over 1.6 million subscribers to its channel and millions of video views per month. Despite this overwhelming success and high demand for Zombie Go Boom content by the content consumers using YouTube's services, Zombie Go Boom's revenues have plummeted by over 90% to the point where they can no longer afford to stay in business due to affirmative acts taken by YouTube with reckless disregard of the content providers that have made it a success to the public. Leading up to March 2017, YouTube began receiving negative press in a series of Wall Street Journal articles which criticized YouTube for permitting racist and objectionable content, such as neo-Nazi and ISIS support videos, to be monetized through the placement of advertisements played during these videos. These articles in turn led some of YouTube's advertising partners to put pressure on YouTube to ensure that their advertisements were not on such videos. In or around March 2017, including specifically on March 20th, 2017, in response to growing concerns, YouTube released a new set of guidelines which purported to set forth a set of restrictions upon the placement of advertisements through YouTube's content providers' videos, which did not meet YouTube guidelines. Such guidelines included sexually explicit, 
racist, hateful, incendiary, or overtly violent videos. These guidelines were never provided to or explained to content providers such as plaintiffs, nor were they ever agreed to by content providers. The guidelines were applied retroactively across all content that had previously been created at the expense of the content providers, including content which had been on YouTube without complaint from advertisers or content viewers for years. In order to quickly and efficiently implement these guidelines, YouTube created a program with a proprietary algorithm which it then withheld from members of the public and from content providers, and which was supposed to demonize any do demonetize, and which was supposed to demonetize any videos which failed to meet its new vague content guidelines. However, these algorithms were never shared with content providers and were never disclosed to content providers, either at the time they signed up with YouTube as a content provider or at any point subsequent to such time in any meaningful fashion. The algorithms did not work. They under-inclusively failed to capture and demonetize content that was sexually explicit, racist, or otherwise not in compliance with the spirit of the guidelines, while over-inclusively demonetizing content that did not violate the spirit of the guidelines and was not objectionable to advertisers, such as plaintiff's videos. The results were thousands of content providers suddenly having their livelihoods jeopardized with the flick of a switch by YouTube without explanation, notice, or recourse. This case is brought on behalf of the content providers, like plaintiffs, who were creating content and placing it on YouTube at great expense, well within the spirit of the guidelines, and yet whose videos were targeted and demonetized anyways due to YouTube's draconian and reckless application of its demonetization algorithms. They go on to cite uh, jurisdiction uh, under the Class Action Fairness Act, Venue is proper because YouTube's principal place of business is there in Santa Clara County, Cal California. YouTube's terms and conditions can be found at youtube.com slash t slash terms and specify that content providers' agreements are to be governed by the law of California. Plaintiff Zombie Go Boom is an Arkansas corporation with its principal place of business in Fayetteville, and Plaintiffs James Sweet and Chuck Meir are citizens of Arkansas. YouTube is an American video sharing website which permits content providers to upload videos to be viewed by members of the public worldwide. Users can view, share, rate, or favorite videos as well as add comments and subscribe to channels of content providers whose content they may enjoy and wish to view regularly. YouTube permits many forms of original content, including videos, television shows, music videos, films, educational videos, short original videos, and other similar forms of content. Content can include such areas as political speech, comedy, education, entertainment, or other forms of artistic expression. All other things equal, there are no limits on the type of content that one is physically able to post to YouTube. A large percentage of YouTube's traffic relates to original content providers who create original videos for the express purpose of gathering subscribers to the YouTube channel. Views and subscribers typically translate into revenue for the content providers due to YouTube's monetization schedule. YouTube monetizes its content by permitting third-party advertisers such as Walmart, Verizon, General Motors, and others to place advertisements at the beginning of videos. Typically, when a user clicks on a video of a content provider that they wish to view, an advertisement will play before the video begins. Users can click on the advertisement to be directed to the advertiser's website. YouTube's advertisement placement algorithm is controlled by Google AdSense, a program which targets ads according to the site content and audience. Depending upon the circumstances of whether the advertisement is viewed, the advertisement is viewed in full, the advertisement is clicked on by the user, YouTube will charge the advertiser a different pre-negotiated fee. A portion of this fee is passed on to the content providers, such as plaintiffs, which incentivizes content providers to focus on creating content as a full-time job. Many successful content providers have been able to earn a living wage or even in excess of $100,000 annually by working exclusively as a YouTube content provider. Plaintiffs fell into this category with over 1.6 million subscribers on the Zombie Go Boom channel and millions of views to their videos each month. Zombie Go Boom is presently one of the top 2,000 YouTube channels in the world, which puts it in the top 1% of YouTube revenue earners. 
content providers, including plaintiffs, have come to rely on this steady stream of revenue and income as they continue to put out new content to be viewed by the world. For instance, plaintiffs have come to expect that in a slow month they can earn approximately $10,000, and in a good month they can earn approximately fifteen. Typically, based on several years of experience as a YouTube content provider, plaintiff's viewership to revenue rate is such that 1 million views translates to approximately $1 to $2,000 in advertising revenue passed through to Zombie Go Boom. Plaintiffs have come to rely on these proportions of viewership revenue as they have translated like clockwork since approximately 2011, when they founded Zombie Go Boom channel. Plaintiffs have, in reliance of these figures, continued to put out new and interesting content on YouTube, which is demanded by the public at large, as evidenced by the number of views and subscribers to the Zombie Go Boom channel. In so relying, plaintiffs have spent resources including time, labor, artistic vision, and money into creating new content exclusively for YouTube with the expectation that, as long as people want to watch the content, plaintiffs will continue to get paid at the same rate they have historically been paid. Plaintiffs have carved out a decent living while also engaging in a career that they love, creative and entertaining filmmaking, through the Zombie Go Boom YouTube channel. In early 2017, YouTube was hit with a wave of bad press because the Google AdSense program was allegedly placing advertisements on videos that contained hate speech and sexually explicit material. For instance, several articles, including a string of articles in the Wall Street Journal, reported that YouTube's AdSense program had placed advertisements for companies such as Pepsi on videos of ISIS supporters and neo-Nazis spouting hate speech. Advertisers were disturbed by these reports, and there was a backlash where approximately 5% of YouTube's advertisers backed out of agreements to place their advertisements on YouTube's content providers' videos. Big-name advertisers such as PepsiCo, AT&T, Dish, and Starbucks were reported to have pulled the plug on continuing to advertise through YouTube.com, as fear grew that their advertisements might be associated with undesirable videos of fringe lunatics. YouTube was thus highly financially incentivized to quickly address these concerns in order to stop the bleeding and prevent further advertisers from withdrawing their support for YouTube's content, which almost universally contained content that was no less appropriate than what could have been viewed on cable television, where these same advertisers were already placing their advertisements and willingly associating their products and services. YouTube responded to these concerns by altering the algorithms in the AdSense program in an attempt to automatically weed out inappropriate content without the use of human oversight. In doing so, YouTube's new algorithms were poorly executed, such that the very types of content that were subject to the ire of news reports and advertisers were still not being properly screened out of monetization, while content that was not any more inappropriate than what someone would see by turning on AMC or the Discovery Channel was nonetheless screened out and demonetized. Zombie Go Boom, along with thousands of other appropriate and successful YouTube channels, were victimized by YouTube's over-inclusive alterations to the AdSense algorithms. YouTube implemented the revised algorithms around March 2017. YouTube content providers and online bloggers have dubbed this date Adpocalypse. As an example of plaintiff's loss of revenue due to the AdSense changes, plaintiffs earned approximately $10,000 through advertisement revenue generated through the Zombie Go Boom YouTube channel in February 2017. In March of 2017, that figure dropped to 8000 After March 27th, Zombie Go Boom's advertisement revenue plummeted from an average of three dollars to $500 a day to $20 to $40 per day, a 90 to 95% drop in revenue overnight. This was despite the fact that viewership of creative content posted by Zombie Go Boom remained steady. The proportion of revenue received dropped significantly because advertisers were no longer being placed on Zombie Go Boom videos due to the content being screened and labeled as demonetized by AdSense. Case in point, pre-March 27, 2017, 1 million views on the Zombie Go Boom channel would translate to approximately $1 to $2,000 in revenue. Post-March 27, 2013, 2017, I'm assuming that's a, uh, that's a typo, 1 million views on the Zombie Go Boom channel would translate to approximately $150 in revenue, an 85% drop. YouTube implemented a secret rating system that is only available to be viewed by YouTube and advertisers which automatically rates videos using the AdSense algorithm in a similar way to movie ratings or video game ratings. 
After the videos are automatically put into a category, advertisers can then choose to filter their advertisements to only be placed on certain categories of videos. None of this was ever explained to plaintiffs or to other content providers, despite the fact that it was essential to their businesses to know how they would ultimately be paid through advertising placed on their YouTube videos. By not telling content providers that this rating system existed, or how the algorithm worked, YouTube was causing damage to content providers because the lack of transparency led content providers to make different types of content than they otherwise would have been making to maximize their profits. Replicating the pre-March 27, 2017 revenue became impossible for plaintiffs, as it would have required hundreds of millions of views per month just to make ends meet. At the time, plaintiff's YouTube channel was receiving 6 to 10 million views per month, which is roughly equivalent to the number of views that a popular, popular television show on cable would receive. And yet, plaintiffs were not being paid enough to cover the costs of making their content due to their videos being demonetized. Zombie Go Boom content was denied the opportunity for an appeal of the demonetization decision, and plaintiffs were given no explanation by YouTube, despite numerously requesting answers. YouTube never provided any advance notice to plaintiffs that it would be altering its revenue model in any meaningful fashion that provided sufficient specifics for plaintiffs to be put on notice that any changes might affect their channel. YouTube never provided plaintiffs any advance notice that it would be implementing any new terms by which plaintiffs' videos must adhere, which indicated to plaintiffs that their content might be subjected to demonetization. The only such communication received by plaintiffs focused on YouTube's desire to demonetize hate speech. Plaintiffs' videos contain no hate speech. YouTube's Terms of Service, identified above, do not contain any advance notice or indication whatsoever that YouTube retains the rights to unilaterally alter the terms by which content providers will be entitled to receive revenue or have their content monetized or demonetized. YouTube intentionally withholds information from content providers regarding the existence of this hidden AdSense algorithm so as to maintain secrecy and control over its revenue stream, which not only unfairly leaves content providers in the dark as to the status of their livelihoods, but also stifles growth and opportunity by discouraging content from being created and posted in the first place. Plaintiffs relied on the fact that they were historically receiving $1 to $2,000 per million views in revenue from their content in creating new content and continuing to participate as a top YouTube channel. Plaintiffs suffered tens of thousands of dollars in tangible and calculable harm as a result of YouTube's decision to, and without advance notice of, alter the terms of plaintiffs' revenue sharing agreement with YouTube. In fact, if this demonetization of plaintiff's content continues, plaintiffs will have to shut down the Zombie Go Boom channel and find other work. Prior to the adpocalypse, plaintiffs were offered $60,000 by an interested buyer who wanted to purchase all of plaintiffs' existing online content. After adpocalypse, the buyer has rescinded the offer and now has represented that they would not be able to come close to paying anywhere near that amount. As an additional example of harm suffered, plaintiffs were receiving advertising deals outside of the context of YouTube for $25,000 to promote other products through a video advertising of goods and services, including video games such as Dead Rising prior to the adpocalypse. After the adpocalypse, plaintiffs reached out to an advertising partner and explained the situation regarding their drop in revenue and agreed to lower their contracted price of creating a video to $3,500. Due to YouTube's restrictions on plaintiffs' videos, the response rate to videos created by plaintiffs did not garner the business that was anticipated, and the advertiser was ultimately forced to reduce the compensation to plaintiffs to $1,150. YouTube's adpocalypse-related content, in particular its lack of transparency with plaintiff regarding its AdSense algorithms and failure to provide advance notice of these changes, interfered with plaintiff's contractual relationships with other business partners, rendering them considerably less valuable as a direct result attributable to YouTube's content. YouTube continued to benefit from plaintiff's placement of new content on YouTube's website... Website? YouTube continued to benefit from plaintiff's placement of new content on YouTube's website following March 27, 2017, through users being drawn to the YouTube website as a result of plaintiff's creative works and labors, including through YouTube receiving additional revenues through advertisements or otherwise that were viewed by these users. YouTube also benefited from existing content created and uploaded by plaintiff that was already present and existent on YouTube, which continues to attract new users to come to YouTube.com and view Zombie Go Boom videos and other videos. 
YouTube sent vague communications to plaintiffs through the process of implementing its AdSense changes, which indicated that content providers would only be subject to demonetization if their videos contained hate speech or were personally deselected by advertisers. YouTube also represented to plaintiffs that it was concerned about the livelihoods of its creators, and thus it would be providing an appeal process if a content provider felt their video was being unfairly demonetized. However, plaintiffs requested appeals of YouTube's decision to demonetize their content never received any feedback as to why their videos were demonetized or whether any appeal could be initiated. YouTube ignored plaintiffs' repeated requests for review. Plaintiffs allege, on information and belief, that content providers were not the sole cause of the precipitous drop in revenue suffered by plaintiffs, and that YouTube's demonetization algorithms were primarily to blame. This allegation is based in large part on the fact that the content of plaintiffs' videos is similar in nature to content that is present on popular TV shows such as Mythbusters and The Walking Dead, though significantly less violent or graphic than The Walking Dead. And yet many of the advertisers whose ads previously appeared on plaintiffs' content also place their advertisements on Discovery Channel and AMC. YouTube was aware that this issue was causing widespread discord with its content providers, as evidenced by a posting it made on its own website. YouTube states, We know that revenue fluctuations have been unsettling and want to reassure you that we're working closely with our advertising partners to make sure that YouTube continues to be a great place for creators to earn money. We recognize that there is still more work to do. We know we have to improve our communications to you, our creators. We also need to meet our commitment to our advertisers by ensuring their ads only appear against content that they think is suitable for their brands. YouTube goes on to admit that it is receiving a large volume of complaints from content providers about a lack of transparency with regard to the terms which are governing the revenue streams that act as lifeblood for these creative content providers. YouTube has a duty to disclose, with detailed specificity and complete transparency, the terms by which content is selected or deselected for monetization, as well as the structure of payments that will be provided to content providers as a result of advertising revenue generated to its content providers because content providers rely on an expected revenue stream as a source of income and require these assurances in order to invest in the expense and time necessary to create new content. Failing to disclose this essential information to content providers, along with maintaining unilateral control to change the terms and conditions which govern the payment received by content providers for their creative work, is anti-competitive, harmful to the creative content market, and also a breach of good faith and fair dealing. Content providers gain nothing by such a lack of transparency, and YouTube gains everything by withholding the information and keeping its content providers chained and in the dark. Plaintiffs seek a court order mandating that YouTube make its revenue-sharing rules, including both the demonetization and monetization qualifications and programming, and the structure by which content providers are paid a share of advertising revenue generated from their content, available in complete form to content providers at the time they first contract with YouTube to provide such services to YouTube. Plaintiffs allege that this is necessary to prevent another incurrence of adpocalypse. Plaintiffs also seek monetary damage against YouTube on behalf of content providers whose revenue streams were negatively impacted by adpocalypse. And then they start in with some class action allegations. Plaintiffs bring this action under Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 23 on behalf of the following class. All content providers in the United States who uploaded content on YouTube.com at any point since 2006 and whose videos were available for public viewing on YouTube.com during the time frame of March 1st, 2017 to present. The class consists of thousands of content providers, making joinder of each class member impracticable. The class is presently ascertainable by reference to objective criteria and based on records within YouTube's possession. Common questions of law and fact exist for the causes of action and predominate over questions affecting only individual class members. Common questions of the class include whether YouTube's acts and practices constitute unfair methods of competition, whether YouTube engaged in unfair acts or practices in the conduct of trade, whether YouTube engaged in deceptive business practices with respect to its handling of adpocalypse, whether YouTube made material misrepresentations and omissions with respect to the terms by which plaintiffs and class members were agreeing to become content providers, 
YouTube's motives for devising and executing its modification of class members' content provider monetization structures, whether and to what extent YouTube profited from its modification of class members' content provider monetification, mon 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 monetification? Whether and to what extent YouTube profited from its modification of class members' content provider monetization structures, whether YouTube violated California Business and Professional Code 17200, whether YouTube's conduct constitutes tortious interference with contractual relations, and or prospective economic advantage, whether YouTube's conduct constitutes a breach of quasi-contract or regular contract, whether plaintiffs and class members are entitled to equitable relief, whether YouTube's unlawful, unfair, and deceptive practices harmed plaintiffs and class members, whether YouTube's conduct is substantially injurious to content providers, the method of calculation and extent of damages for plaintiffs and class members, whether plaintiffs and class are entitled to restitution, and if so, in what amount, and whether plaintiffs and the class are entitled to any other appropriate equitable relief. Moving on to the claims for relief, they are claiming unfair and unlawful business practices in violation of the unfair competition law, California Business and Professional Code 17200. YouTube's conduct is in is unlawful. YouTube's conduct is unlawful in violation of the UCL because it contravenes the legislatively declared policy against unfair methods of business competition. Additionally, YouTube's conduct is unlawful because, as set forth below, it violates California contract law principles, including breach of contract, breach of quasi-contract, breach of good faith and fair dealing, common law fraud, and tortious interference with contractual relations and or prospective economic advantage. YouTube engaged in unfair methods of competition and unfair trade practices that violate the UCL in the following respects. With the intent and effect of stifling open and vigorous competition in the market for content providers, YouTube devised and executed a material change to its advertising terms and AdSense practices without providing any notice, either before, during, or after, in any conspicuous manner, to plaintiffs or other content providers. YouTube intentionally caused adpocalypse to occur in an effort to appease its advertising partners at the expense of its content providers. YouTube conditioned the operation of content providers on their adherence to YouTube's non-transparent advertising policies and practices, including the AdSense algorithm and content rating system. By forcing plaintiffs and class members to adhere to these undisclosed practices and forcing YouTube's policies on content providers, YouTube has obtained an unfair advantage in the marketplace and has hindered competition for content providers. YouTube has caused considerable harm to plaintiffs and thousands of other content providers' businesses by imposing its policies on content providers. YouTube acted to inhibit competition in a manner that is unfair and substantially injurious to the consuming public. YouTube's unfair methods of competition and unfair acts and practices are contrary to California law and policy and constitute unscrupulous, unethical, outrageous, and oppressive business practices. YouTube has indicated that it considers itself free to commit similar injurious acts of unfair competition in the future. As to plaintiff's second claim for relief, they're claiming fraudulent business practices in violation of the unfair competition law. To induce the posting of content on YouTube.com, which in turn led advertising partners to contract with YouTube, YouTube provided a monetization structure to members of the public interested in becoming content providers. YouTube provided very little information to content providers about the structure of how they would be compensated under the monetization schedule, but did historically provide fair compensation to content providers in exchange for the revenue generated as a result of the artistic and creative work that they created and posted on YouTube.com. Historically, content providers came to expect a certain return on investment in dealing with YouTube under this structure, which remains steady and predictable. Plaintiffs relied on the fact that historically they could expect a certain return on investment to the content they created, as described above. In their third claim for relief, plaintiffs claim tortious interference with contractual relations. 
At the time YouTube unilaterally altered the terms of its monetization structure for content providers, plaintiffs and class members had entered into business transactions with third-party advertisers, purchasers, and other businesses, which were premised in large part off of plaintiffs and class members' ability to monetize their content and receive both advertising revenue and views on YouTube. These sales transactions involved various contractual conditions of sale. A fourth cause of action is the breach of contract, that a contract existed between plaintiffs and class members and defendant, that uh, they altered the terms and conditions unilaterally in breach of contract. Breach of duty of good faith and fair dealing. All parties to a contract are obligated to refrain from preventing one another from receiving the reasonably expected benefits of the contract. Breach of quasi-contract. Through unlawful and deceptive conduct in connection with the terms governing monetization of content providers and the algorithms used by its applications, such as AdSense, to select for demonetization, YouTube has reaped the benefits of plaintiffs and class members' creation and posting of content on YouTube and related participation in the YouTube community. Wherefore, plaintiffs on behalf of themselves and the class respectively uh, request that this court certify the class enter injunctive or declaratory relief as appropriate, order restitution or actual damages, order award plaintiffs trebled damages along with pre- and post-judgment interest, award punitive damages, order YouTube to provide notice to the class of this action and the remedies entered by this court, and award reasonable attorney's fees and costs as permitted by law, and any other relief deemed just and proper. So... What do we think of that? On one hand, even I was affected by the adpocalypse, and I am completely on board with an effort to recover the funds from that and fix it so it doesn't happen in the future. On the other hand, isn't YouTube a third-party website, and if I don't like what's going on in YouTube, I can just move to another website or open my own? So what this case is going to come down to is exactly what level of duty YouTube had to provide to its content creators and its advertisers, how that all balances out about who they're supposed to notify and what, whether they violated their own contract or whether they violated one of these um, unwritten but still applicable contract terms that fall under uh, this, this Business Fair Dealing Act, uh, the California Business and Professional Code. Um, so really the case is going to come down to the contract and the duties under the contract and whether they were breached. And it's, it sounds very meritorious to me, but it also sounds like it could be a lot of, um, empty claims at YouTube because it might not be that YouTube is ultimately responsible for the advertisers pulling out. But if they are somehow responsible for the advertisers pulling out or the contract, uh, or not, 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 not notifying the, the content providers, not being clear enough with them about how they're getting paid, maybe they do owe some kind of money to the content providers. Uh, like I said, even yours truly had seen a pretty good dip in revenue. April was when the uh, United Airlines thing happened, and I had hundreds of thousands of views, but yet my revenue was way less than usual. So I was very disappointed and we had to take steps to step up Patreon and, and think about um, doing other things to make sure that, that YouTube is not the only revenue stream. And that's really not how we want to be doing business, that I want to be making more videos for you, not concentrating on, on non-video related or non-legal related crap, really. So how do you feel about all this? Do you want to join this class action lawsuit? Are you looking forward to that letter you get in the mail that says, hey, all you've got to do is write back and you're part of this class? Uh, or do you think this is all just a bunch of malarkey and it, it's probably going to get dismissed? Google's got a bunch of money, so how could they possibly uh, stand up against, um, how, how could the plaintiff stand up against Google YouTube? Well, we'll see. There's a few ways it could play out. If this somehow survives a motion to dismiss, then the plaintiffs will be asking for discovery, and they will definitely be asking for discovery of, um, of Google's algorithm or structure for determining what gets monetized and not. And if Google doesn't want to provide that, 
to the plaintiff's attorneys, then maybe they'll pay up or something. I don't know. We're still talking about a rather hefty amount of money. So I think this one, I'd give this one a 50-50 chance to go into court, which is actually pretty good. A lot of cases don't go to court. More than 80% of cases don't go to court. So that's uh, very interesting, that one there. And I look forward to it, to seeing where it goes. I am Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. I would like to thank all of my supporters on Patreon, on the Discord, on here. People have sent me money via PayPal. People have sent me their thoughts and their love and their appreciation, and that's all wonderful. You can leave your thoughts in the comments below. You can post things on the Patreon. You can send me messages via Twitter. We have live discussions going on uh, on Discord. All of those links are in the description below or will be or should be able to be found easily somewhere. I would like to thank my $50, uh, plus, um, $50 per month plus supporters. Uh, August supporters are Joshua Meinsinger, Baxorn, John Cripps, Nate Beck, John Steele, Weston Loney, and Lydia Collinson. Thank you all so very much for your, uh, for your blessed offerings to the lawful masses. Um, all of the $5 plus supporters are scrolling on my panel behind me as well as in the description below. New Sensei, I would like to thank him for his $500 contribution. He has sponsored a video that will be coming up on the basics of copyright for YouTube creators that should be coming out later this month in August, and I'll provide links to that retroactively so that anybody who's seen this later will still be able to find that link. Thank you all for joining me so much. I will see you in my next video or see you in, uh, well, in real life online, I guess is, I don't know how you say that, uh, in online life. That IOL? No, that doesn't work. Anyway, I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. Continue to have a great week and continue to be great people. I love you all.